Let's talk about the worst spring break that's ever happened. <laughs> Language, isolation, and Edgar Allan Poe coming up today in Spring Break by John Crowley. Spring Break 2016. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> and welcome to the Codex Cantina where I am Una. And I wish I was still college student crypto. <laughs> if you are new to the Codex Cantina, we take a conversational approach to the literature that we read. If you're down for checking out some of the most important stories that have influenced even today's writers, hit that subscribe button to join us. And as always, we start off publication information. Spring Break by John Crowley was originally published in August of 2017 and was re-released in 2019 in the book And Go Like This. This story won a 2018 Edgar Award and was recommended to us and it is fantastic in my opinion there's a few themes that we have to talk about here today isolation old and new and technology of the future what does our future hold <laughs> now what i'm gonna do is go through a quick plot recap to make sure we're on the same page and then we're gonna jump into our discussion and analysis for the remainder of this video so for plot we are in some type of a futuristic world we go on spring break to Woo! the campus of Yale University, <laughs> where Wait, online what? education <laughs> has become so prevalent that going to school in person is a foreign concept. Uh, sounds a lot like 2020, if you ask me. <laughs> right. Now, the quads are empty. No one goes to the library. And we have this quote, thinking of all these buildings being full long ago. Now, when it's all collabs across the world, actually better for sure but still there was a kind of sadness to feel just wondering what it would have been to go to classes in those buildings and throng around the quad all day hugging books talking to professors like f2f maybe i was born too late tomorrow was going to be utter <laughs> uh, it gives you a good taste of the language of this one until we run into this creepy librarian and they tell us that they're going to show us the most valuable book in the world it's called edgar Allan poe's book <laughs> and the blind librarian kind of like leads us inside turns us around and next thing you know we're tied up and, and captured and stacked behind a whole bunch of books turns out our dude's kind of a mass murderer not just a librarian on the side so we're locked up and forced to look at books, 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 until Seymour Chin comes to our rescue with a karate chop frees us. And um, we go to the Yale Hospital and we recover. <laughs> and plot. And plot. <laughs> <laughs> so first of all, let's talk about how the narrator starts telling us the story, because that kind of starts to give us some clues. We have the quotes like, Dropped my stuff and sat down on a futon couch and felt a little, you know, I don't know. <laughs> so, so immediately, we know we have a narrator that is very diminished in his abilities to at least articulate his feelings, right? Well, I would actually argue that a little bit. I think that language evolves over time because if you went back... 100 years 200 years ago you would struggle or they would struggle to understand you even though you're speaking the same language because nuances change and you know the way that we use words change the definitions of words and the stop of speech the reliance on you know facial cues because of the words you use that all evolves over time and although it feels frustrating to read a book that is set in 2060 or 2040 or whenever based on what we use as our traditional speech pattern, it is difficult. But I think that he's kind of hit the nail on the head here of that's what our language will evolve to be the norm. And I even catch myself doing it where I use at least some of the words that my students use as I try to keep up with how they speak because it's the way they understand. And although it may feel foreign to us, it actually is a better way of speaking to, to get your point across to a younger generation. I'm bussing here. <laughs> I, I, I agree with everything that you said. And even in this story, we have Seymour Chins, who doesn't communicate through words. He likes to communicate through emojos. Emojis. Yeah, right? emojis. They don't even call them emojis now. And you have those people that communicate through, like, GIFs these days. Like, they don't even, like, use words to express themselves. There's a visual you mean presentation. GIF? GIF. GIF'd up. 
<laughs> Jiff it up. But I would argue, I would argue for you to think a little bit further about that comment about I felt a little, you know, I don't know, right? It's not that there's a new word for it, and maybe it's we forgot what. But arguably, he's unable, and there's a couple of different examples in this where he's unable to express his emotions. And to your point, maybe that's as the world evolves, as he talked about in the story about how he's isolated. Hello, 2020. Um, he may not have that emotional experience with people anymore doing all digital interfaces and, 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 and interactions F to F. <laughs> yeah, face to face. I, I think that's true. I think that also, I guess, the reason I kind of disagree with that is a lot of times when you are having casual conversations or you're having internal monologue like he is having, I see that all the time when I'm speaking with people not in a professional setting, they'll say things like, you know, you know, you know, or like, mm -hmm. like, like, same. Mm -hmm. I mean, that that's a key word that a lot of younger people will use is they don't need a lot of frivolous words, you know, to express how they're feeling. Same. That's it. They're done. And I think that's what the the main character here is doing is he is expressing himself the best way he knows how. I don't think he's, he doesn't know how, but it's the best way he knows how. Obs. And also, arguably, to your point, when you do a lot more digital interactions, you know, depending on whether you actually visually see the other person that you're talking with, especially if it's just audio, like maybe how you and I are talking, we don't necessarily know when the other person's done talking. There's visual information there. That maybe, you know, and those those endings are kind of leading the next person to continue the conversation. Now, another thing that kind of happens in this story, too, is we have this quote, Up in the corners of buildings and on the edges and gutters were these faces, little heads of monsters or like demons, staring, <laughs> grinning, showing teeth. Not for kidding. They were there. <laughs> you know what he's talking about, right? I don't. Gargoyles. On buildings. He has oh. forgotten the word for gargoyles because that's an old concept. Oh, okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. And don't forget, he also called the church the churchiest church he's ever seen. <laughs> so maybe because language he's never evolves. seen one before, probably. Yeah. Yeah, but but also the inability to articulate it is rather interesting. And maybe maybe he hasn't had a need to describe architecture, particularly if you're not going around looking at architecture with other people when you're all remote. But I think this is clearly John Crowley is having a conversation about how language and how will we evolve with language. And I got to imagine that you as a teacher see this sometimes in your formal essays where students will put text speech or things that are part of casual conversation and you probably have to correct them sometimes. We were like, no, 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 buddy, buddy, you, you can't put this in a formal essay, right? This There's proper speech and then there's in colloquial speech, right? I have to preface all the time that you cannot put IDK as an answer. That is not acceptable. <laughs> it, 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 it's true. And I, I guess I don't want to be like negative or down upon it because things do evolve and change. And I'll be like, oh, this generation is so much worse and we're getting dumber as a species. I don't think that's true at, at, at all. I think that what is important or what you need to maybe articulate changes and evolves over time. Like I yeah. wouldn't know how to describe certain things from a hundred years ago because it's not relevant to my life anymore. And in a hundred years, what we need to describe now, uh, you know, knowing how to use a map or how to use paper money, that's going to be completely irrelevant, right? You wouldn't need to know how to describe that. hundred percent agree on that. And, and I think we're calling out maybe even just beyond time. I mean, there's obviously this old new concept, right, with the gargoyles here like we talked about. But we, we clearly have things in this text that clue us in that the digital interactions and non-face-to-face, -face, we talked about the face-to-face -face comment earlier, but we also have this quote, I went over to one of the pillars and put my hand on it, the stone, worn by the ages, cold and rough. Not even VR can give you those feels. <laughs> and, and I get the concept, right? When you are digitally or only virtually interacting, it's not the same thing as being there physically in person. And this is a very different conversation, I think, with this text that John Crowley is bringing up. Yeah, for sure. And that kind of leads us into maybe the next theme of this is like, in my opinion, is that of the technology and how much it impacts our lives and how much it will change us in the future of the VR versus the reality. Because Seymour Chin, he's never met in real life and it feels like it's 
one of his best friends, or if not his best friend, the guy saves his life and, and risks his own life, goes into this, you know, freaky place that's called a library to save this guy he's never met in real, per, you know, in, in real life before. Um, and, and so this concept of how does VR versus reality affect you uh, of the old moving towards the new and technology is going to be that vehicle to do that? Right. For I better think, or worse. Well, and I think technology has proven itself in 2020 to have been invaluable with this pandemic. If we didn't have a lot of the technological advantages, you saw in the beginning of this how people felt so isolated, sadness, all the things that John Crowley documented here. But we learned and technology evolved even in this pandemic to allow us to still try to connect with other people. You and I did a Netflix viewing party where we watched a movie at the same time and were able to talk about it as opposed to hanging out in person and stuff like that. There are things that technology allows us to still bring together, but I agree, it's not the same as F to F. Am I right, OBS? <laughs> <laughs> that, that's it's very obvious if you just go back 10 years ago uh to hurricane katrina when that went through and wiped out uh new orleans there was no school for well over a year and those students had to go back and do all of that they weren't able to go digital because there was no zoom there was no google meets those things hadn't been created yet and definitely I've seen the impact positive, a little bit negative as well, but I, I think that as much as sometimes we might harp on the, the language of this, I think that overall Crowley is trying to say that the technology will be beneficial even though it does have its limitations to reality of uh, F to F. <laughs> I love the way that he played with a lot of words in this. I wrote down a couple just to kind of share with you, but instead of et cetera. Oh, oh I did too. Nice. It's and et cetera. And the one sweet shirt yeah. <laughs> instead of sweatshirt. And then my favorite was claustrophobic, which became close, close to phobic. <laughs> and we do this all the time, right? With JK and BRB. I love the way that John Crowley was afraid mm -hmm. to just completely imagine the way that language could evolve. The one that I, I had to go back and I had to really think about was, hey, Joe, I think is his equivalent of dude. Like, bro, dude, mm -hmm, bruh. Mm -hmm, I mm -hmm. think Hey Joe is, is the equivalent of that. And I, I do love the little play on the words. It does make it a little difficult to read. And I did finding myself having to reread sentences several times in order to try to figure out what is he truly trying to say in my language that I would understand. Now, how dare we have neglected this for so long, having only mentioned his name twice in this short story talk so far? Edgar... Alan Poe. <laughs> okay. Particularly if you're assigning this to high school students, which is a great story to have this communication and technology, but something that like, I think would really enhance, you know, like the syllabus of this course is to have assigned some Edgar Allan Poe stories before this, because I don't, did you pick up on some of the homages to Edgar Allan Poe throughout this whole story? Yeah, I think there are several in here. And the one that I picked up on the most was the cast of Montiato, where, you know, he's sealed away and, and we have, you know, being sealed away behind the books. So, books, yeah, it's books, good. I love books. it. Books. Books. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I agree with that one. Did you notice there was even a direct quote from the Telltale Heart? Uh, I don't know. I might have missed that one. So we have a quote when basically the librarian's being arrested and we see him on the Fox News. And he says, the disease had sharpened my senses, not destroyed, not dulled them. Above all was the sense of hearing acute. I heard all things in the heaven and in the earth. I heard many things in hell. How then am I mad? Which is a direct quote from the Telltale Heart where the narrator is basically telling you that he has this heightened sense of hearing. He can hear anything, right? And we just went through all of this interesting concepts about language and the perception and the ability to hear kind of what the other person is saying. I thought it was kind of like a subtle little nod to use that quote about hearing and being all perceptive from the telltale heart. Did you notice that the, the librarian speaks very different than everybody else in the story? Do you oh, yeah, think that's a sure. nod that education is a defining factor between 
different classes or how we speak or how we maybe view ourselves as better because the librarian definitely viewed himself as superior to everybody else because he could read books or had access to books where everybody else was on their tablets. I really wanted to make the argument. I, I don't think I can. I really wanted to make the argument that the narrator's speech evolved after reading the books. I, I really thought that was part of it, but I don't know if there's enough evidence for it. But before, I was looking for that as well. Yeah, yeah. So before before the books, we had like quotes where he'd say, "Wow, this place is old. The buildings look like castles. Old corroding, I guess, like granite. Pointy windows. Pointy tops." Pointy everything, where in all of these sentences, the most we have is five words. The number of syllables is very short. Very simple sentences. Evolves towards the end. It, it evolves yeah. a little bit. A but little I don't bit. Know, I don't know how good of an argument it is, but I, I wanted it, it was to an be intentional, there. right? Yeah, I, I don't know if it was intentional or not, but I, I was looking for that, and I thought maybe it was there, but I'm not sure. But um, another thing that made me think about is, I know you haven't done it with me on this channel, but have you ever read The Murders in the Rue Morgue by Edgar Allan Poe? I have not. That's a really cool story where this murder happens, and the shtick of that one is everybody overhears the, the potential murderer, but nobody agrees <laughs> on the language that he used, right? Oh, so it's kind of like the telephone game where everybody has their own in interpretation. Right, and then there's mm -hmm. even like the way that this word is spelled with like o rang o tong right? And that's actually like another unique way to spell orangutan, basically, right? So even in the way that that story played with language, of understanding different cultures, understanding different points of views, and even how words are spelled differently, I felt like there was a lot of homage through that, through this entire John Crowley text as well. Yeah, I could see that. And there's tons of other references, too. Like, I'm sure there's other Poe references that we're not bringing up right now. But, you know, you had Alice in Wonderland with Tweedledee and Tweedledum and, you know, the idea of the drink me potion and then this going into this crazy world and stuff like that. This really felt like an honest and just very literary homage to some of the greats that have come before him. And I can see why this won an Edgar Award. Well, one, because he played up to a whole bunch of Edgar Allan Poe references, but I think this really is meant to have a lot of fun with literature. So to my earlier point, I don't think it's unfair to assign to high schoolers, but I think if you're including this in your syllabus, including some of these other homages that students can get some of these intertextual references, I think it'd be even more rewarding to your coursework. I 100% agree. I think that if you can pair these together, you're going to be able to get more out of this and get to the point of what Crowley is trying to, you know, profess is how important education is. And that while language may change, gaining knowledge should never be downplayed. Guys, I don't know how popular John Crowley is with you. Please let us know down below. Share this video if it was helpful. Because if you guys want us to cover more John Crowley, let us know. And we'll be happy to put a playlist down below and cover more of his stories. I had a blast with this story. I really did. Let's move into our subjective ratings, which shouldn't mean anything from an objective quality rating of the story. It's just how did it impact us with what we've read, what we saw from the story? Crypto, how did you take this story? So this one's tough for me. I want to give it so many different scores. I don't know if there's a lot here analytically except for comparing to the other stories. So is that a lot of analytical stuff? I guess so, if you could use it and say, well, see how this person did it, and they're using this story to incorporate it into their story. My enjoyment was tough the first read through because what was his point and then learning the language barrier and trying to like learn this new language to understand these students at Yale in the, you know, far future. Um, I, I, I just, I was... I don't know. He made fun of nerds, I feel like. I feel like there were a couple of jabs at the fantasy RPG. Did you pick up on that? Yeah. He did it yeah, twice. Right. He, he made fun of the fantasy RPG kids. And, you, you know, we're nerds around here. You know, I'm, you know, check out behind me. Um, no, overall, I think I'm going to give this one a solid eight. Uh, I think that there can be kind of something for everybody. And the more we discussed it, the more 
I feel like I was able to pull out of this one of what was the point? Why did you do it this way? And those subtle nuances start to make more sense once you discuss it. So if you're sitting down and you give a student a syllabus and say, we're going to read these three Poe stories, and then I want to see if you can figure out why I chose these three after we read Spring Break by John Crowley. So... Yeah, I, I think it could be very useful in an education sense. Okay, you set, you came up a lot higher than I thought you were based on how you started that sentence. For me, <laughs> I had an absolute blast with this on my second read-through. My first read-through, yeah. I would echo, I felt similarly where I wasn't sure where John Crowley was going with this one. And it was only once I realized he was playing with language, and I'm th- I honestly was thinking of you about how you know, students will put text speech and IDK into their papers. <laughs> How frustrating that has to be. I thoroughly enjoyed once I realized he wasn't making fun of or specifically criticizing that. He was really just playing with that concept and having a good time. I, I had a blast with the story. I'll go with nine out of 10 on this one. Highly recommended to bring to your students after you assign a couple of post stories. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> they need context. Definitely have to have context to get this one. So guys, we post videos every Monday and Thursday. If you're down for a conversational approach to literature, hit that subscribe button to join us. Guys, we look forward to seeing you on the journey. Una out. Peace.